Good morning, everybody. <laughs> I was just explaining how scattered I was this morning. Is that true for anybody else? Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's pray. Let's pray and uh, just ask God in the midst of all our scatteredness and craziness that he would just meet us where we are, shall we? Gracious and Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for you. We thank you for the chance to, what, together? to pray, to worship, to give ourselves to you. We thank you for this time. We thank you for this space. We thank you for those who are joining us online. We thank you for those who are willing to brave uh, coming here this morning. Whatever it is, Lord, we just give ourselves to you. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. to your name. We just lift your name up, Lord.
take a seat. Do you find that the Lord talks to you in the most unexpected places? I don't know if this is something Pastor Bill wants to have going out on the airwaves, but I finally asked the Lord yesterday afternoon, why do we always have to meet in the bathroom? And, uh, I just really felt like the Lord said back to me, because this is the only place you're truly quiet, Ramona. And I can really talk to you. I can say some things to you here. And I thought, well, Lord, you made my body, so you already know everything about me. The thing about worship Proverbs says that when we worship the Lord, we get wisdom. 
I need wisdom. Anybody else in the house need wisdom? Hallelujah. We're going to sing a song by Matt Redman. It's been about a year, almost a year to the day that we sang this song last. It's called Pure Light. And as you sing this song this morning, I want you to really pay attention to the words. This is a song of deep worship within a prayer. You know, total surrender to God in our spirit and the truth of laying ourselves bare before him. For only in seeking to know him do we experience the in intimacy of being wrapped in his presence. And that's what I want when I worship. I want my soul laid bare so that he can just speak those things that I need to hear, those secrets, those bits of wisdom, those places that I need to be shown where change needs to happen. You know, we sing songs that we're familiar with and the words just kind of fly out of our mouth, but the word says that our words are creative. There's power in them. So when we worship the Lord, I don't want to waste a minute. And I hope that in the few minutes that we get together here on Sundays, that these aren't just the few 15, 20 minutes that you spend in your week worshiping God. We need to really understand that place where the soul cries out, holy, holy, holy. It's my intention to be intentional in that space of worship, not to let it grow stagnant, but let it to be ever moving forward into a more revealing place of my Father, my God, my Savior, my Redeemer. Is that the same for you? Be like Isaiah when we see the Lord high and lifted up. We all sing that song or listen to that song. I can only imagine what it'll be like in his presence. Will I dance? You know, folks, I think I'm going to be flat on my face. Absolutely in total wonder. we will totally understand why it is that the elders around the throne prostrate themselves down every time the cherubim and the seraphim sings out, holy, 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 are you Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Oh, praise his name. Praise his name. He is so worthy worthy of much more than 15 or 20 minutes of my time on a Sunday morning. The God of all creation bends down and touches the one, touches the hundred, and touches the thousand. Oh God, may we have your heart and your eyes and your mind your mind, Lord, for the wisdom that we need in these days. The eyes, Lord, that we may be there for those moments that you have predestined. For your heart, Lord, to understand that the days are short. You are coming. And the word needs to be preached. You are calling us, your church, to something more. You have shut the doors and you have put us out into the world. Lord, let us not stop and wait 
for something else to happen. Let us move, God, in this place that you have told us to move. Praise and glory and honor to your name. Praise and glory and honor. Hallelujah to your name. Hallelujah to your name. Praise you. Let your people know, Lord, they are not without a strong arm. They are not left sitting on the side of the road. But they have a Savior who holds it all. They have a Savior who is a redeemer of everything. And his blood is more than we could ever ask or comprehend. Praise your name, Jesus. Praise your name, Jesus. Praise your name. Praise your name. <sighs> Hallelujah. Can you receive that this morning? Can you receive that?
As you first showed your love to us. Praise your name. Praise your name. Praise your name. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to Praise him. He is worthy. He is so worthy. Worthy is his name. Comforter is his name. Deliverer is his name. Healer is his name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, prepare our hearts, prepare our ears this morning. As your message is brought, your word is opened. May a new revelation of you, Father God, be imparted to us. We pray and we ask you this in your son's name, Jesus. Amen and amen. Am I switching? Nope. Okay, we're good. <laughs> oh, par for the course this morning. You have no idea. <laughs> I've actually appreciated going through this uh, series on jerks of the Bible. And partly because, you know, we hear what could be really familiar Bible stories. And to look at it from a different perspective is really helpful. I, I do dislike the fact that uh, we're able to read the stories necessarily because they take so much uh, space in Scripture that uh, we would spend... I wouldn't be able to talk about the details as much. So I'm hoping you'll be able to read these either before or after the fact. Uh, we do have the bookmarks to at least tell you the characters. And uh, we'll share those verses with you. But So this morning, you know, as we kind of deal with it, there are plenty of jerks in the Bible we could talk about. And this time in particular, there are a lot of them. Uh, the time we're talking about, you, you may recall that Israel had, had separated into two different kingdoms. There was kind of a, an internal political strife and religious strife, and so there was the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And the southern kingdom was named Judah, and the northern kingdom kept the name of Israel. And the southern kingdom didn't have, much, didn't have a very good record. About 50% of their kings were bad. They were jerks. They did not do well. They didn't do well in leading the nation in serving God. Uh, but the northern kingdom had a much better record. 100% of their kings were jerks. And uh, they, they were just all bad. And the time we're hitting now, uh, when Ahab became king, Scripture actually says that he had, it was the worst to date. That he was worse than all those who had came before him. 
And so he would certainly be worth talking about as we look at jerks of the Bible. But instead, we're going to talk about his wife, Jezebel. Uh, we're going to talk about, uh, her, see, the, obviously the nation was supposed to do their best to follow God. And Ahab was not interested in that. Instead, he, uh, he married Jezebel, who was not a uh, Jew. She was one of those who, from a uh, foreign land. And she was really interested in bringing the worship of Baal to the nation of Israel. Now, you don't need to know a lot about Baal. Just know that he was a, uh, sometimes pronounced Baal, uh, B-A-A-L. And he, he was a, a fertility god for the Canaanites. Fertility was really important, obviously, in the ancient world, and uh, because two of the most important things to have to be able to continue to function were kids and crops. And so fertility gods were really about trying to get that going. And so and it required a lot less than certainly the commands of God, and so Ahab probably saw the benefit of, of having uh, a national faith that didn't require as much. And Jezebel was all in favor of it, but as, as you might expect, the prophets of God, the folks who continued to hold the lamp that said, hey, no, God called us for a purpose. And they continued to speak out against it, and so Jezebel took it upon herself to use the forces of the kingdom to quash them. You may know the story of Elijah. Elijah was one of the prophets at this time, and he comes before them and before the king Ahab says, just to let you know, because of the choice you're making, there's going to be three years of famine here. There's going to be three years of drought and famine, and uh, Elijah takes off and goes and hides while Jezebel is killing off the prophets. That there are some of them saved. Uh, Obadiah, this guy named Obadiah, is hiding them in caves. They're trying to survive. And those, after those three years, Elijah comes back and says to Ahab, says, by the way, uh, you know, this is going to be lifted now. But we are going to have this interaction. And they, ha they decided to have a showdown. Maybe you remember the story between the prophets of Baal and Elijah. Where they go to Mount Carmel and they say, let's just put this to the test. Let's have you guys all morning long. You can put out your offerings in the altar. And instead of lighting them on fire, you're just going to pray for Baal to prove that he is God. Prove that he is Lord. Matter of fact... The name Baal literally means Lord. And so they say, just pray. Just pray and see if that light on fire for you. And it never happened. Instead, Elijah comes along and after making his offering even more difficult to light, prays and God sets it aflame. And the people who were otherwise enthralled with the years of Jezebel's work of trying to bring ball worship and the Asherah poles to the nation, they cried out instead that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was the Lord. And then dispatched with the prophets of Baal, 450 plus and some others. Well, Jezebel promised, said, okay, I see what's going on here. So... I'm going to kill you too. Well, she doesn't seem to find him as he takes off. And there's an interesting story there. But we're going to go on as Jezebel continues to go after him and does. Well, we find out why Jezebel, this one story in particular, just really hits, uh, just really sticks in my craw, which is Ahab wanted this garden that was next to the palace, owned by this guy, Naboth, Naboth. Sorry, I shouldn't repeat it differently. I'm supposed to say it with forceful and authority. You guys would never know the difference. And he wanted this garden. He goes and he says, hey, let me purchase this from you. And the guy can't. I can't sell this at any price. I can't give up. Uh, our inheritance not going to do it. And so the king, Ahab, just goes back and he pouts. He just is sullen and he pouts because I really want this. And Jezebel says, well, you are ridiculous. We'll get this. So they invite him to a, invite the uh, Naboth to a, a dinner party and have a couple of scoundrels that are willing to surround him and later claim that he had spoke against the king and spoke blasphemy and that he should be put to death and they were willing to be witnesses against him and sure enough they dragged him out, killed him 
and Ahab was able to get this garden after all. Elijah found out what had happened, came and spoke to them and says, I just need you to know, because of the height or the depth of your jerkness, you two are going to die. Bloods are going to, dogs are going to be licking up your blood. Sure enough, that happened to uh, Ahab. He was leading a, a war and got shot with an arrow and bled. Uh, bled out over a long period of time, and sure enough, the dogs were licking up his blood as, as he died. But Jezebel seemed to outlast even Elijah. Elijah was gone by now. Uh, her son took the throne, and later another prophet came. Another prophet came and, and spoke against her, and as she, uh, as they were meeting, some of her servants turned against her, threw her out a window to where the dogs were. So a noble end, but uh, as we look at her, you know, there, there are these stories that clearly she's a jerk. But I want to try to get to what her issue is. That is her issue, and it's really interesting, that second prophet who came along, as he was talking to her son and saying about what it is that the nation should be, he points out what her issues are, specifically idolatry and witchcraft. So seriously, we're going to talk about idolatry and witchcraft. Which I, I think has got to be kind of strange, right? Because it's not for the most part that we sit around and that we're struggling with like, yeah, yeah, I was holed up all weekend because there was so much snow, so I made uh, an idol out of the snow and started worshiping it. Like, I, I doubt it, that happened to any of us. Witchcraft isn't much of a thing for us. I mean, it certainly does exist. And I think it is certainly worth talking about. Even here in the West, in uh, the Portland area, we have uh, places and people dedicated to witchcraft. And, uh, you know, but that's certainly even more true in throughout the world. And God has definitely spoken against those kind of ideas and that kind of work. And, and in part, when we look at it, you know, because, I, okay, I want to talk, one of the struggles with talking about witchcraft and idolatry is that typically preachers that I've heard jump to kind of the root behind them and let's talk about the deeper things that we could fall prey to. And I want to get there, but I don't want to skip over the obvious. That for followers of Christ, engaging in any kind of divination or magic or any of that kind of stuff or trying to participate in these kind of things is is antithetical to what God is about because okay let me let me talk about witchcraft first so the idea behind magic generally the worldview behind magicians and shamans and and I'm not talking about you know people you know reading Harry Potter or going to a magician show in Vegas or something that uh, that's not the, the problem is there's this worldview that above all of us is this force, this power that, we'll do, that, that sociologists just call the cultus. It is this power and this force of being able to do things outside of the natural order and being able to create that. And the reason in the pagan gods were gods is because they were really good at controlling the cultus. They could command at will and throw lightning bolts from their fists and do these kind of things that they could control these forces. Well, what a, a witch or, or a magician or a shaman was trying to do was also with certain incantations, certain uh, words and uh, stuff, trying to control the cultists to do their will. And ultimately, that is the problem. You see, because some have suggested, well, you know, if we try to use that worldview and look at the idea of God, well, what, what it is is God is the cultist. He said, no, 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 that doesn't work. Because what God makes clear is he isn't to be controlled by any of us. He chooses the younger over the older. He chooses the lowly as opposed to the great. He chooses even the greatest of all, his son, to be born in a lowly stable. He is not easily determined, and he is definitely not controlled. And it is that control factor that makes witchcraft, and among other things, the problem. It is trying to control, as imagine that you have the power, of the spiritual forces around you. I, I literally went online, went to 
witchcraft.org. Oh, I should point out that it was the first, by the way, where a Jehu, the second problem was idolatry and witchcraft. How can there be peace as long as all the Isabel bound? But he goes on, uh, what I said is I literally went to a website about witchcraft called witchcraft.org and they talk about the spells that they do and they cast carries the entire responsibility for the results of a spell they cast. So while similar in concept to a prayer, a spell is a far more personal force. I think that captures the very idea I'm trying to talk about. That for someone trying to control, you know, whether it's, I'm going to use these crystals, I'm going to do whatever it is, the idea behind it is it is a personal force. I control the forces of the spiritual world. And so, to my understanding, it's unlike a prayer at all. Whereas a prayer is a supplication, it is a sublimation of our own ideas to that of God and His agenda. The problem with witchcraft is controlling, or the spiritual forces you think you control. I use that phrase as the thing you can control. There was a, a childhood star of mine died this past week, Carmen. Maybe you recall, he would do kind of this, I don't know, it was popular in the 80s and 90s, at least among some niche of kind of storytelling and singing kind of stuff that he did. And, and uh, one of my favorite songs that he had done, and maybe I could, uh, maybe on the YouTube version or whatever, I'll link it. It's called A Witch's Invitation. And as he's telling this story, he actually, the, the story behind this in the song is that he was encouraged by this witch who apparently knew of him that says, come, I'm a warlock, I'm a male witch, let's talk about, uh, and he shows them all the things he had done, all the, all the spells he had cast and, and some of the effects of that. And he says, what can your God do to compare to this? And basically, his discussion goes in the story, and I'll leave it to you, says, really the issue is not what, I'm not going to compare God's miracles with your spells. But what I will compare is my soul, the state of my soul to yours. He says, because when it comes, and at that point of death, when the spiritual forces you think you now control come for the rights that they claim to your soul, what incantation, what spell will you cast to get them to leave you alone? He says, I would simply say, I am bought with the blood of Jesus. Notice the difference. One is, God did something for me, versus that which I do for myself. The forces you think you now control. And so the problem with witchcraft is that idea of a personal power. I control. I control these spiritual forces. And for what it's worth... I have seen those who claim to be Christian who also seem to somehow claim that they can control the forces and the powers of God himself. So those who claim witchcraft, it's a central issue of controlling spiritual forces versus being subject to God. And frankly, the idea with idolatry is very much the same kind of thing. I read a longer passage here in Psalms when it talks about idols. And specifically against, but um, not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory. It's not about our control. It's not about what we get. It's about you, God, and you get the glory because of your love and faithfulness. And why do the nations say, where is their God? See, the implication being, well, you don't have any idols. We don't see your God. Where's your God? Where's your statues? We don't see your God. Where is your God? Our God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases him. He can't be controlled. He, does, he has his own agenda, not our agenda. But their idols are silver and gold, made by human hands. They have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but cannot see, they have ears but cannot hear, noses but smell, they have hands but cannot feel, feet but cannot walk, nor can they utter a sound with their throat. That these are, are things you have created with eyes and ears and mouths that if they somehow matter, but they don't... They're not real. They're, they don't have any reality to them. They don't actually see. They don't actually hear. They don't actually speak. They are made by your human hands. And those who make them will be like them. 
so will all who trust in them. That we become more like what we worship. We become more like what we worship. Certainly the idols in our lives are the things that control us. The things that we cannot live without. The things that... I don't know how else to put it. You want to find out if there are idols in your life? Then ask yourself, one of the tests would be, if I didn't have this, then life wouldn't be worth living. And whatever this is, is your idol. Is that what you worship? Like you could obviously say, if I didn't have Jesus, then life wouldn't be worth living. Okay. But I've heard people also say, if I didn't have my health, if I didn't have the ability to walk, if I didn't have this certain person in my life, if I didn't have this pleasure in my life, if I didn't have this prestige in my life, if I didn't have this job or this title, or what, then life wouldn't be worth living, is to say that that is what you worship. Another way, and I know this is harder, and I don't mean this, well, I do mean it, but it's going to sound a bit harsh, but I, I think another version, or another way to test whether there are idols in your life especially if you are a follower of Jesus and you have said, you know what, I know God forgives me, but I can't forgive myself because of this one or sin or whatever. If you know that God forgives you, but you cannot forgive yourself, then it's because you have betrayed an idol in your life that is more important than God. You have betrayed maybe the image of you as, as this good person or that you want to take this certain role or that you see yourself differently or whatever. That you ultimately say what is more important than whether God forgives me that I can't forgive myself because I have always had this image that I'm the good guy. That I am without sin in this area. Whatever it is. And why does this matter at all? There's this really interesting passage in Samuel. That um, what, what's going on is Saul is supposed to you know, not take certain things from the captured enemies. And he says, you know, I'm going to do this anyway. I'm going to get it. I'm going to do it. And then I'll do some of it. See, I'll, I'll go make and if it was done in ways that it wasn't supposed to, then I'll, you know, I'll give to the church and, and, and I'll make things good. And give him his due. Realize the ancient world acted like this. Plato, uh, or Socrates was arguing about this in Plato's dialogues uh, when someone said, well, you know, just was a horrible person and really, and gained lots and lots and lots of wealth and then I could sacrifice to the gods and everything would be okay. Wouldn't that be a better way to live if I could get away with it? But here is what Samuel says when to Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord. To obey is better than sacrifice. And to heed is better than the fat of rams. God doesn't just want your sacrifice. Doesn't just, he wants obedience. He wants faithfulness. He wants to be heeded. For rebellion is like the sin of the nation. Witchcraft. And arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. That at the root, rebellion is like divination. Arrogance is like idolatry. That truthfully, our own sense of our arrogance or rebellion is ultimately what Jezebel's dealing with. She has become so addicted to this idea that she controls the spiritual forces that she doesn't have to answer for the fact that she's trying to slaughter God's prophets. She doesn't, have to, she doesn't feel like there is any moral compunction to keep her from killing somebody because he wouldn't sell to them. She can do these kind of things and continue to move in these circles because she has control. I mean, folks, why is the gospel so hard to accept? The story of Christ is that he came 
that God came in the form of Jesus himself and he died on the cross to forgive your sins and mine, to set the record straight so that we can have a relationship with God. And yet, at some level, that is really, really hard to li live out. Why? Because we have to give up control. We have to say, I can't save myself. I need a Savior. I am not good enough. I need a God who... Lord, I need you to be my Savior. It requires humility. It requires a broken heart. It requires giving up control or at least giving up the illusion of the forces that we control. The fundamental difference. That's what Milton was getting at in his famous poem, A Paradise Lost, as he's kind of describing in different words the story of Scripture. And as he tries to get to the heart of what Satan is after, he says... The better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. That ultimately what Satan is interested in, he says, I would rather control what little I can than to be subject and humbled towards God. Is that true of us too? A couple of skills we can work on to make sure that we are humbled, that we are living in important skills not earth shattering you probably could have named them beforehand the first is confession admitting that God is right taking stock of your life taking stock of your day and to say Lord I have blown it there's probably a huge place in there as well Scripture talks about it, how we can confess our sins to one another, and we should be a whole lot better at that than we are. But fundamentally, at the root of being able to say, God, you're right, and I was wrong. You are God, and I am not. Forgive me, Lord. Confession. And the second is repentance. Repentance is a word I don't think I hear very often. I can't think of an example right off the top of my head that I hear outside of church circles. But repentance means literally going the other way. That you are off in one direction, you change your mind, and you go off in another direction. That you submit, saying, God, that, that I have confessed that I was going the wrong direction. Forgive me for going the wrong direction, but I now turn and go the right direction in obedience in whatever it is that you have asked of me, I choose to change. I choose to follow you. Two skills that we need to practice. One of the things that I fear for the modern church is that we can go away, at least in talking with God, and that he is right and we're wrong. I mean, truthfully, some of us have problems with that, and we need to get better just going, okay, God's right, I'm wrong, he gets to make the call, I don't. We can have problems with that. I don't want to dismiss that. But I think far too often like that character and when Harry met Sally who was in this bad relationship and would tell all of her friends like, hey, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm in this adulterous affair and I don't think he's ever going to leave his wife. And they would say, no, he's not. And her response would be, you're right, you're right, I know you're right. And would say that over and over and over. You're right, you're right, I know you're right. And it was the joke of the entire show was the fact that she was never going to change. She was willing to confess something was off, but she wasn't willing to be any different. And that was supposed to be funny because in its tragedy. And maybe it is, but it is not funny in your life or mine. Simply confessing and saying, okay, okay, I know God has different standards. But without repentance, we are not living in humility. We are living as if we somehow can control the very forces. The other thing about repentance is what we're changing to is a partnership with God. We are going away from saying, I'm doing this on my own, to I, I'm going to partner with God. 
I'm going to be on his side and work on his agenda and we're going to do these things together. And, and he says he's willing. He's willing to offer you and I a new life and he will work together so that you and I can be more of what he has always wanted us to be. That he will help us to work to help transform this world into what it was always supposed to be. And we can play our part in loving him, loving one another and living out our faith every day. Or we could be like Jezebel. Let's pray. Gracious and Heavenly Father, let me just start off and just in confession. It's relatively easy for me to think through my day and my week and to find those times and places where I have chosen my agenda as opposed to yours. And that rebellion that arrogance is like idolatry and witchcraft. And so Lord I ask once again for the zillionth time or for the first time forgive me. And I know that your grace is sufficient and, and, and that my relationship with you is not based upon my own goodness but your goodness that that. Your willing to forgive and accept me as your child is stunning and, frankly, a little bit unbelievable. But I trust you. If you say that you will forgive me and accept me, then I take it. I'd be a fool not to. But Lord, I also need to repent. I need to move in the other direction and I need your grace and your power to do so. To live in more obedience, not just the occasional sacrifice, but real obedience to you in the areas that, well, that you're putting on my heart. I mean, I've got lots of people in this world telling me I should be different, that I should be more of this or less of that. I've got people in my day and people in the world, and news and billboards that tell me who I should be. But Lord, I want to hear from you. Not even my own heart. I want to hear from you. Give me the power to be obedient and repentant. In Jesus' name, amen. Once again. Thanks for joining us this Sunday. I'm playing around with different features, just having fun <laughs> with this whole video thing. Um, not a lot of announcements today, other than uh, as I am recording this anyway, I know that there are still some families who are without power. Um, so, may we be thinking of each other, may we be reaching out, bless my dogs, um, <laughs> may we be honoring each other. I hope that uh, we reach out to somebody this week. Uh, I hope that that's on your heart and that we can follow through on those things. We need each other during this time in our community um, as Linwood friends, um, but then even as children of God. Um, brothers and sisters, all of that. So that's my big announcement. Love on each other. Find ways. Write a note. Give a call. Send an email. Send a text. <laughs> Check on each other. Drop something off. All those fun things. Um, we are in Lent, um, which is a time of preparation as we prepare our hearts to receive our Christ and our Savior and the gift of God. Pretty amazing. So bless you. And I'm just going to close this out in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for all that you do for us. We thank you for this season. Wow. We thank you for this season. It's been quite a year. And most recently, quite some weather and situations. And it just kind of keeps piling on, doesn't it? Um, wow. And here we are preparing our hearts and minds uh, for the coming of our Savior. This is a pretty special time, so may we hear you in new ways. May we discover you in new ways. May we hunger for you in new ways. Bless this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Blessings, everyone. Have a great week. Look forward to being in touch. Bye.